quarters of 15 years. Sorry. Oh my god, yes, we're on it. This is 5 on 20 News, where the news is alarming and the newscasters are just trying to keep it together, with Anis Quintella and Sean Madrid coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. First, the local headlines. Considering the fact that Trump won a presidency largely based off memes and Facebook posts, rather than running a campaign off a real platform, there is much concern and fear over the unknown moves that the wildcard president-elect may pull. Included in this list are worries about his controversial plans for immigration. His promises to revoke President Obama's executive order allowing dreamers to remain legally in the U.S. would particularly affect us here in Arizona, where we have upwards of 20,000 registered undocumented immigrants who have been granted temporary protection from deportation in order to work and have even been allowed to apply for driver's license. Lynn Marcus, the co-director of Immigration Law Clinic at the University of Arizona, said, quote, there are going to be devastating losses for the immigrant community. There's no way of sugarcoating that. She said to expect more efforts to deport people, including detentions and raids. This is especially troublesome to dreamers who have had to provide their names and, uh, and addresses in order to be granted protections under the Obama administration. Marcus recommends that any dreamers who have already come forward should renew their applications now while Obama is still in office. Post-election, our neighbors to the north hit the streets in protest of Donald Trump. 200 high school students walked out of several schools in Phoenix yesterday, and hundreds, many of them ASU students, marched through downtown and to the Arizona State Capitol chanting, Out Donald Trump. Today, Tucson High students staged a walkout at noon. If you're like us, you're still in shock over the results of Tuesday night. While turning to the comfort eating of pumpkin chocolate chip cookies and or taking shots of whiskey until you forget what happened are fun ways to process your emotions, we're here to offer you a couple slightly more productive alternatives. On Monday, November 14th, U of A students will be holding their own peaceful protest and march in reaction to the new president-elect. The protest will be held from 5 to 7 p.m., meeting at the UA Mall. The Facebook event page has over 3,000 shares, with over 500 people confirmed going so far. That event is open to all who are interested. There will also be a post-election organizing summit tonight in Tucson at the Global Justice Center at 225 East 26th Street. The summit will be held from 6 to 8 p.m. and is also open to the public. According to the event page, this will be a, quote, community meeting to organize resistance to intolerable and oppressive election results in all levels of government. And in case those events aren't enough to quench your thirst for political activism, Tucson will play its part in the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline on November 15th. This event is one of many that will be occurring in cities and communities nationwide as part of the No Dapple Day of Action. Communities will organize outside of local Army Corps of Engineers buildings in a show of solidarity with those at Standing Rock and to demand that the federal government and the Army Corps reject the pipeline. Our own local branch of the protest will be meeting outside of John McCain's office at 407 West Congress Street on November 15th at 5 p.m. Puff Puff Pass. Marijuana advocates say that they will try again to get marijuana legalized in 2018. Tucson attorney and legalization supporter Michael Crawford says that there are a few changes needed for the next referendum, including more protections against special interests. Prop 205, which could have legalized marijuana, failed the ballots on Tuesday by a four-point margin. While the no came from conservative voters, others voted against the referendum because they felt it was too friendly to big business and dispensaries. Local smoke shops largely opposed the referendum because they would have lost sales of paraphernalia to the dispensaries, which would have been able to sell smoking accessories. California, Nevada, Massachusetts, and Maine all passed initiatives to make marijuana legal. Arizonans spent the next day looking out west, sighing wistfully, and trying to get a scent of that Cali wind. And now, in national news. The angry creamsicle met with Barack Obama today, and our president described the discourse with Trump as excellent. What? At least he didn't call it amazing, terrific, or tremendous. That would be a bridge too far. Anyway, the intense rivals met in the Oval Office and focused on a smooth transition, not a reconciliation of policy. 
Trump described meeting President Obama as a great honor. The president-elect is sure acting humble all of a sudden. I mean, right? Republican House Speaker Paul Ryan and Vice President-elect Mike Pence were also present for the 90-minute meeting. Now, Trump is starting to reach out to a slew of foreign leaders. Kind of wishing Obama could moderate those meetings as well, because I kind of feel like Trump requires adult supervision. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton took the saying, take a hike, literally. She was on a pleasant stroll with Bill when she bumped into one of her supporters. And BuzzFeed News has obtained Trump's short list of administration positions, and it's scary. The list includes 41 names and covers 13 departments. Some lowlights include Governor Chris Christie for Attorney General, Ben Carson for Secretary of Education, and former Governor Sarah Palin for Secretary of the Interior. Turns out that uh, you, may not have to have, you may have to have a master's degree and several years of experience to get an interview for an entry-level job in our country right now, but you just need a few scandals and zero relevant expertise to be in the running for an influential seat in Trump's cabinet. A Trump insider has stressed that this list is not final, but, well, we're just stressed. Fear strangled 47% of the American public as a specter of Trump approached like a flaming pumpkin with a mouthful of steak fat and Axe body spray. Social media was filled with messages of people airing their fears and then receiving vitriolic responses. In other words, America is alive and well. From his promises to re repeal major environmental legislation to gutting the Obamacare law, a large portion of citizens are on edge. The New York Times is asking if Trump will undermine our political system, which, let's face it, happened months ago. Trump supporters fought against the fear post, claiming that Hillary supporters are being sore losers and babies. This, of course, after crying for months that the system is rigged, but evidently that argument is only made when your side loses. Despite his promises to unite America, Trump is going to have a tough time getting the two sides to agree on how terrific things are. Yesterday, protests flare flared up around the country in response to the presidential victory of Donald Trump. Crowds gathered in New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, and more, with many protesters choosing Trump property sites. A large group formed at New York Union Square and marched to nearby Trump Tower, where protesters set up a camp for the night. Loaded dump trucks surrounded the building, a security measure to keep any of the protesters out, as if any would want to stay at the gaudy Trump Tower. The LA Times reported that flames could be seen from the sky, as a few California cities held Trump effigies to show their displeasure with the decision. Stand by for an email from your uncle with a meme comparing those effigies to the Death to America protests in the Middle East. Conservative commentators mocked the protest, criticizing the gatherings as whinings and saying that nothing can be done. Funny how quickly the concept of free speech can be forgotten. Our thoughts are with the teachers, activists, and local leaders who have to work extra hard in light of the fallout of this remarkably awful election cycle. Some news sites also use deceptive practices to disparage the protests. Publications such as BearingArms.com and ZeroHedge.com reported a shooting of five people at a Trump rally in Seattle. In reality, the shooting occurred near the rally but had no connection to protesters. The only recorded incidents at the various rallies were a man detained in Portland for assault and a trash fire in Oakland. That's not exactly a, an atypical occurrence. Dozens were arrested in New York City, Richmond, Virginia, and Los Angeles, and more for disorderly conduct. We get the feeling that we may be talking about disorderly conduct a lot in the next few months. And in international news, yearly, nearly a year after some sanctions were lifted, Iran is becoming more of a tourist destination. Visitors from France, Scandinavia, and even the U.S. have been attracted to the, co the country's ar ancient artifacts and unique culture. Officials estimate that 5.2 million tourists poured into Iran last year. Tourism serves as an important bridge of culture, especially in the Middle East. There is another side of Iran other than the angry mullahs shown on the news. And in many, Iranians are open-minded and modern. But don't book that tour yet because the American tourist boom won't last long. Donald Trump, we don't have to call him president yet, plans to destroy the Iran deal and reinstituting sanctions against the country. We may never achieve that elusive dream of seeing a crowd of Iranians singing along with Justin Bieber. This was Anias Contella and Sean Madrid for 5 on 20 News. Next up, take a look at an exclusive interview with 5 on 20 anchor 
Madison Brodsky and Tucson comedian Polly Casillas pre-recorded just before the election. After that piece, Sean talks dead people. Well, congratulations on all the continued success. Your show was recently chosen as a Tucson Weekly staff pick, yeah, right? Yeah, cool. That was very cool. How did you find out about that? How did that go? They, they, I just someone sent me a text saying it was it was picked by the staff. I mean, like every every year, there's always the Tucson best of, and I'm never in the comedians thing. Right. But I mean, it was cool that they picked that show because I'm very proud of that show. It's been it's like almost four years now we've been doing it here. And it's a unique show. It's not your average stand-up show. And then, uh, do, you, do you know the parameters of it? Yes, okay, I do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun to do, and I love doing it here. What do you think makes that show so different from your other shows? Well, the, well first off, the audience is involved. They send the joke mm -hmm. topics. Because, I mean, if you're at a comedy show and the audience is involved, sometimes they're just heckling, and that's not good. But they throw up the topics. They feel like they're part of the show. And it also shows comedians how to be funny on the spot. And they build their stage presence, and they get they lose that nervousness. You get on stage, you're like, I'm gonna be funny, or not like that, because yeah. that'll crush some people. So, but this is it, this is fun, and it's loose, and I never know what's gonna happen. Is improv important when it comes to comedy shows? Yeah, I mean, being like when you're on the spot and you have to be funny, that's important, and improv's good at that. But then they strip away the whole team vibe about it, and it's just you up there. And that's what's scary about it, because when if you're not being funny and improv you can just volley it to someone and let them handle it but it's you and you're up there so it's yeah. you sink or swim really so when did you realize that you were funny well i've always been fat so <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, so growing up when, I, when, when you have to have a personality and i've always been funny and i've always had a sharp tongue and quick-witted <laughs> okay and i just finessed that into this little stand-up career that i've been trying to d battle my way through from tucson but yeah, just I've always been like the guy that could tell a good story or tell, hey, tell, do that thing. You know, that guy at the party yeah. for the party type of deal. So now I'm just. He's my favorite guy. Yeah, yeah. The fat funny guy. <laughs> of course. Yeah. So let's go to another little form of your comedy side. Yeah. Your comedy side is blown up on Twitter and your social media. Yeah. You have a very large following. So how did I do you? Well. I do well. For Tucson, that's <laughs> a Tucson, very yeah. large following. Yeah, yeah. So how did you gain so many followers? Honestly, it just like I was I've, I was on Twitter for a while. I've been on for a while, so mm -hmm. it's like it, it picked up steam when um, I was just tweeting out jokes and stuff like that. And it's it's just really stream of thought stuff. Like I'll tweet stuff and then forget about it, or I'll see what the response is and maybe I could take that to the stage. So I'm fo I'm more focused on trying to be funny in real life now than building more of a Twitter following because now I got that now mm -hmm. I got to work on being a great comedian just as a, a huge comedian as I am on Twitter in real life basically so right yeah but you're verified now that I, see that's the thing I've been verified and now Twitter's <laughs> verifying everybody and it makes me feel like man what what like it's not am I not special anymore yeah, it's like well how did it feel originally oh that that was that was cool it helped me get shows. That's what that was key. That was key because if I could have had all the following, if I didn't have a blue check mark, I can't show up in LA. It's like, hey, can you put me on the show? Like now they check me on my social media. Like, oh, well, yeah, let's put him on the show. He has the following. And that, well, I was gonna ask you, does social media help you book jobs? Yes, it does tremendously. Like I wouldn't be on Laughs on Fox on TV if it wasn't for that. But also, you have to be funny too. You can't just mm -hmm. you can't just be the funny online and just be like a total wet blanket in real life because no one's gonna no one's gonna like that right and it, it's weird because i've seen that too like people mm -hmm. have that following they'll take it to la and it's just like they fall on their face mm -hmm. because it's easy to sit in front of a computer and think of something up but when you're funny on the spot that's that's totally like if a tweet bombs you can mm -hmm. delete it but if you're bombing on stage it's like no you got to come up with gold now right or else so you would thrown. rather someone in la call you out there than for you to just move out there with yeah, a dream. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to chase the dream. I want to build it and be big from here to go out to LA. Well, that makes sense. Substance, so. That's very smart. Yeah. That's the dad in you. What is your favorite compliment someone has ever given you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like they told me I was funny, but I hadn't been on yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, oh, you were the best. Like, thanks. And yeah, then, like, makes you feel like you're going for yeah, something. Yeah, but I mean, I, you, when you, after a show, you meet the drunkest people like this is this is a great one i was talking to a guy for 15 minutes and he was telling me about his life 
and stuff like that and how he enjoyed my comedy and then when he was like leaving he's like all right ralphie may i'll see you later he thought i was the comedian ralphie may oh my gosh and that's funny like, oh man we were talking <laughs> for so long yeah I thought we were connecting i thought I was like oh man i'm making fans out here and he thought i was some other fat comedian well i mean i guess in a way you can take that as a compliment yeah yeah because you're funny you'd be like man ralphie may was <laughs> trash in phoenix what, what was <laughs> that about well I then mean, you got away with it yeah yeah i'll just blame that all on ralphie Okay, so I'm kind of scared to bring this up, but I have to. Yeah. So let's talk about the election, because we're only five days away from electing a new president, and you recently went to a Trump rally here in Tucson. Yeah. So how did that go? Tell me about the experience. Well, I had a couple uh, drinks before, mm -hmm. obviously, but I just wanted to see the circus. This circus is only coming once in a lifetime, I felt. So it's <laughs> okay. like, I gotta see what's going on and what, 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 what's drawing these people out here. And then I go out there and see like old co-workers that try to get me fired. And I started putting two and two together and I was like, oh, okay, ah, I see what's going on here. <laughs> the circus is yeah. full circle. Yeah, full circle. Okay, so let's play a clip yeah. from one of my favorite people that you interviewed. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that the interview speaks for itself. Yeah. So let's just play it and we'll watch this. His dick is trash though, like, he, like sex is just like with him. I don't know anything about that. I'm you a virgin. You, you're a virgin? Yeah. Oh, so now you're saving yourself for trouble. I am. Well, I do have big boobs and that's something that I think he'll be interested in. And I have white skin too. I noticed there was a trend in, with white skin in the rally. Yeah, that you a know. A lot of people, if not everyone, had it. What do you feel about comments of him saying that you just got to tell women to shut the hell up? and put them in their place. You know, as long as I can get my green card and those billions and billions of dollars and be on Dancing with the Stars, he can tell me anything he wants. You got the right business, mine. I think you, I think you'll love you. Thank you. Thank you. I think so too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and now come on, that can't be real, can it? Uh, it you want it to be and it's believable, <laughs> but she, she's doing a form of her own protesting. Okay. So, so she's not that. actually but but I don't want to take the magic away because people believe and they should yeah. believe that that's real because that's the message that he's sending with the, his actions. Mm -hmm. So shout out to her for pointing out the hypocrisy in his words with her own little with her own little uh, protest peacefully protesting. But it was yeah. it was for sure one of the funnier funnier people that I've seen there. Is there any other funny events that you're working on right now? Uh, just every Wednesday, Mr. Heads. We got comedy. That's that's a three to four year old, old show, and that's probably the longest running open mic here in Tucson that they've ever had. And then also the switch, which is every first Tuesday at the screening room, which is okay. a great venue down on Congress. So. And that's your show. That those are the shows I do. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys know of a special guest who should be on our show, please let us know on my social media links below. And Polly, thank you so much for oh, coming in you. today oh, and chatting you. with us. It's Appreciate always it. a pleasure to have you here. I thought I was going to be sweatier. I'm not that. I'm not that <laughs> sweaty. Like there's beads up there, but no, it's fine. Well, they'll dry off. Come back anytime. Yeah, we yeah, love having sure. you. You made us all laugh here in the studio. <laughs> it was a great time. For 20s and Turning on Five on Twenty, I'm Madison Brodsky, and I cannot wait to gossip with you guys right here next Tuesday. See you soon. Hi. So, if your stamina for loss has not been squashed, here are three dudes who lost their lives today in history. A strong man, a string bean, and a poetic libertine. Here we go. On this day, in 1891, French poet Arthur Rimbaud died of bone cancer at the age of 37. The ailments were initially thought to be arthritis of his left knee, which had become so painful that he was planning to undergo surgery. He would have to travel to France for the surgery, since he was living in Yemen at the time. He had, in fact, lived many places in his life, including Java in the Dutch East Indies, which is now Indonesia, and Ethiopia, before settling in Aden, Yemen. This wide and wavering quest for experience easily plays into uh, his self-perception as a poet. Here's a quote. I turned silences and nights into words. What with unutterable, I wrote down. I made the whirling world stand still. From his 100-line poem, The Drunken Boat, Rimbaud characterized, uh, is, uh, characterized is, he's considered a symbolist poet, which is characterized as uh, invoking rather than descriptive. 
and uh, that it comes from like the poet's soul rather than the poet's mind. But back to his death. Uh, he was in Yemen, and before his trip to France for a knee operation, a British doctor mistakenly diagnosed him with tubercular synovitis, or inflammation of the synovial membrane, which is uh, a membrane that connects joints. Um, and so the doctor recommended immediate amputation, uh, during which uh, it was discovered that he had bone cancer. On November 10th, uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he was dead, uh, noted his sister Isabel. The priest, astounded by so much reverence for God, uh, basically uh, through his sister Isabel, gave the last rites. And he said he had never seen so much strong faith, which, again, he's referring to the sister. And so thanks to the sister, uh, Rimbaud has, uh, was brought to Charleville in France and buried in its cemetery. And he has like a marble monument there. So it's like a prestigious place to be buried, I guess. And on this day in 1912, a uh, famous Canadian strongman, uh, Louis Cyr, died at the age of 49 from chronic nephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidneys. His health was said to be failing from excessive eating. At the time of his death, he weighed 400 pounds. Uh, some of his feats included pushing a freight car up an incline, lifting a 512-pound rock, which he did when he was 19, and lifting a platform on his back holding 18 men. For his most famous performance of strength, Louis resisted the pull of horses on each arm while men cracked whips to agitate them. Youch. According to former International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness Chairman Ben Weider, Sir was the strongest man to have ever lived. His life story is told in the 2013 French film Louis Sir, Le Homme Le Plus Fort du Monde. So the strongest man in the world. On this day in 1973, David Stringbean Aikman, a country banjo player, and his wife were murdered in their home he was 58 at the time, and according to uh, close friends of Stringbean, he was modest and unassuming and lived a frugal life, probably as a result of growing up during the Great Depression. Two of Stringbean's cousins were eventually convicted of his murder. John A. Brown and Marvin Douglas Brown both were 23 years old. It seems like the cousins might have thought that Stringbean was wealthy since he was famous and on television, frequently appearing on the variety and country music show Hee Haw. In truth, he didn't make that much money. He did, however, drive a fancy Cadillac. But because he didn't trust banks, again, a Depression-era neurosis, he kept all the money hidden around his tiny cabin in Ridgetop, Tennessee. Years after his death, $20,000 in deteriorated cash was found behind a chimney brick. Stringbean might have gotten his name from his lanky build, which was accentuated by him wearing these pants at mid-thigh. Um, talk about gangsta. <laughs> At the time, there were two predominant ways to play the banjo. Three finger picking, or uh, made famous by Earl Scruggs, and the claw hammer, or flailing, uh, considered more old fashioned. String Bing, along with his hee haw co star, Grandpa Jones, were the most celebrated performers of that style. And we'll show you a video of String Bing.
I'm just wondering where I can find a plaid shirt that long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the big and tall store, obviously. <laughs> so this was Sean Madrid. And Ani Escantella. For 5 on 20 News. Have a great night. See you tomorrow.